Well, good evening. Um, thank you very much for that uh, inspiring introduction. Um, we're here to debate tall buildings. We're here to debate tall buildings in London. And if we get our job right this evening, we're all going to need that glass of wine in the Florence Room afterwards. It doesn't always come, by the way, with these events. So we're honoured and grateful to the RIBA this evening. Now, um, I think this, this debate is about as exciting as the debate which is currently, um, currently happening about tall wind turbines in Britain. Um, it's an interesting question, although I think it's quite a crude one, isn't it? You know, are tall buildings blighting London's skyline? Perhaps you should be asking the question um, whether or not we could ever imagine a world in which we have tall buildings in London that don't blight our skyline. But anyway, let's, uh, let's just start off by taking a quick straw poll on how many people agree with the proposition this evening. Hands up. Are tall buildings blighting London's skyline? And those who disagree? We'll go home now. <laughs> the panel, the pa yeah, they're, they're all heading for work. Um, the panel came into the, to, to one of the meeting rooms here earlier this evening, all in absolute agreement, but after half an hour of, of, uh, of earnest discussion, they started fighting. So um, I know we're in for a cracking evening. Um, I wanted to just ask whether or not um, the tall buildings that we're seeing now are really the visions of St. Elia, or whether they are the visions of Ridley Scott in our cities, um, whether or not they hold the key to solving the problems of the sustainable city, or whether they cause those problems. Um, the global number of buildings taller than 200 meters has tripled since 2000. So I don't know whether that's new millennium penis envy, or the, the, the arrival of new technologies, a, a shift from rural to urban living, because by 2030, of course, five billion of, of us are going to be living in the cities of the world. It's worth bearing in mind when the first sk skyscraper was built, the first skyscraper um, officially is Chicago's home insurance building of 1885, designed by William LeBaron Jenny. Um, could have been the pyramid of Khufu at Giza, um, that 55 meters, that is a true skyscraper, although a little bit of an obtuse one, although it wasn't, of course, built for occupation, um, not by the living, at least. Uh, and so uh, uh, Mr. Otis didn't have to invent his, uh, his safety elevator, key component, a key turning point in the development of tall buildings. Um, we live in the city which for 250 years hosted the tallest building in the world, which was St. Paul's Cathedral. Not the current one, but its predecessor with the spire. Uh, uh, followed by Lincoln Cathedral at 160 meters, which wasn't so much a skyscraper as a sky scratcher. And ever since then, architects have built overhanging, cantilevered, pointy, tall buildings in order to, if not reach towards God, then reach towards some other greater goal. That might be money, it might be science. Um, cryptically, uh, Nicholas Galabov of the Architects' Council of Europe um, said, the future of skyscrapers depends on where architecture will meet science. Architecture is created to support the way of life, to provide the needed comfort and peace. It shall inspire love, creativity, happiness, of which we'll see lots on the podium this evening, um, the interaction with science can stimulate the creation of a new harmonious built environment. It is worth striving for because we shape our buildings and then they shape us. Although I'm not sure I want to be shaped by a shard or a gherkin. Um, I have a very august panel around me, which is why I'm going to stop talking now. To my right, who's going to speak first, Rowan Moore, architecture critic of The Observer, also uh, for Architecture Review. You, you'll read a lot of Rowan's work, and it was Rowan's piece for The uh, Observer which sparked this whole debate. Uh, followed then by Peter Rees, chief planner for the City of London, who has held that position for many years. How, how long now, Peter? 27 years. You can direct your complaints at him. Um, third up, Julia Barfield of Marks Barfield Architects, responsible for one of the most interesting, contentious tall structures to have graced the banks of the Thames. I'm sure you know which that is. And finally, uh, Chairman of the National Trust and eminent journalist Simon Jenkins to my left here. But first off, I'd like you to give Rowan Moore a very warm welcome. Well, the first thing to say is there is nothing wrong with tall buildings. They are part of the repertory 
of architects. Um, there are good reasons why they're built, and London is definitely a city of tall buildings already. There is, there is absolutely no way it can return to some sort of pre-1960 uh, nirvana of, of, of sort of Canaletto-esque skyline. Um, however, I do uh, agree with the proposition that the skyline of London is being wrecked by tall buildings. It is because of the way it is being done. Uh, and it's not just the skyline either. And in fact, I think a lot of the discussion about tall buildings uh, kind of obsesses a little bit too much about that kind of picturesque effects, but as also what happens at ground level. Um, so although tall buildings are fine and noble and can be exciting, beautiful things, um, there are some very important aspects to the planning and design of tall buildings. Um, one is their cumulative effect. What happens when you build several in a city? Um, and I would suggest that the uh, zoning laws in Manhattan that have been in place since, I think, 1915 are an extraordinarily good way of ordering uh, tall buildings um, without going into a great deal of detail. Um, they allow height. They allow um, invention, expression, innovation. But they also have a sense of the entire city. They give coherence to the whole city. Um, and they also have an idea about what is the relationship of, of, of towers to the street. Um, there is nothing like that in London. And you can say London's a different case, which it is. It's not a grid city like Manhattan, but perhaps consideration could be given to something like that. The other important thing about tall buildings is that the higher you go, the more visible you are, and therefore the harder the architects and their clients should try to achieve an outstanding work of architecture. Um, and the harder planners should try to make that happen, whatever that might mean. It's not just me who thinks that. Uh, the London plan, as uh, written under the leadership of Ken Livingston and revised by Boris Johnson, also thinks that. It says that the, the Ken Livingston version says, um, all large-scale buildings, including tall buildings, should be of the highest quality design. They should be suited to their wider context in terms of their proportion and composition and in terms of their relationship to other buildings, streets, public and private open spaces, the waterways, or other townscape elements. They should provide high-quality spaces, public access, relate and relate positively to water spaces. Um, I would suggest we're not really seeing that. What happened is that uh, early on in the sort of tall building boom of the last 10 years, you had proposals like the Shard, um, the Gherkin, in which uh, very well-known architects designed towers with a certain quality, you might say, that, that showed you could tell there was something about them that they were designed by um, a sort of leading architect, although you could also criticize, for example, the Shard's lack of, of interest, really, in, in, in doing much for its surroundings. Um, or, or indeed, the Gherkin is, is not great at ground level. Um, but they set a mark from which there has been a progressive, uh, continuous, and fairly rapid decline. And um, if you look at a building like this, which is the Strata Tower in Elephant and Castle, I can't really see any of those things that the London plan asks for uh, in it. Um, I mean, I can't see really quality design in this, and I think it's kind of on the onus, the onus should be on people who want to build towers to tell me what's good about it. Uh, there's not really public access. It doesn't create great spaces at ground level. It doesn't make any kind of meaningful relationship with its surroundings, either the existing ones but or future ones, because the area is going to be demolished. Um, it doesn't seem to have any great sort of consideration for how it appears in longer views. Um, it does have uh, turbines on the roof um, in, out of deference to a, another requirement of the London plan that tall buildings should be sustainable, but as is well known, these turbines are almost never seen to move. Um, 
and it has John Terry apparently living in the top. Um, but that's that's a, a personal matter, so so we'll we'll uh, th that's not really the, the concern. Um, and it's not just this. There's the Vauxhall Tower, um, and there are a whole lot more towers that I talked about in my article, which seem to have a similar um, lack of real design quality, lack of real thought about how they relate to their surroundings, how they add up to making a city. Um, and I mean, if you look at the area around the Vauxhall Tower, where a lot of taller towers are proposed, um, there is no sign that the public realm there, which is monstrously horrible, is, is significantly going to be improved. In fact, recently there was another tower proposal which was opposed by Terry Farrell, who had drawn up the master plan for that area, um, and his objection was simply ignored. So this admirable idea that you might have good quality towers has, has been completely eroded uh, and, and lost sight of. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it's a basic principle of designing buildings that they don't act alone. They act with what's around them, both at the scale of the whole city and at the more immediate scale of what's around them. And most tall buildings in London are simply not doing that. That's why I uh, support this motion. Thank you. Our next ex expert witness is Peter Rees. Peter. Fact. <laughs> Men with small penises buy red sports cars. Architects, on the other hand, well, don't take it from me. Let's go back to the early 70s. Louis Hellman, the great architectural cartoonist. Whole page of the Architects Journal. The image is Hyde Park, the Knightsbridge side, and an elderly lady with a rolled umbrella, which is waving in the air, is dragging uh, a panting, rather overweight policeman across the park towards a figure lying in a dirty raincoat on the grass who bore a passing resemblance to Casson, <coughs> and protruding from his loins and with his hand around the Knightsbridge barracks. <laughs> and she's saying, officer, you can't let him do that there. <laughs> that does sum up one image of why architects build tall. I say there are two reasons for building tall. The building tall, -ish, uh, the, the building tall approach that started in Chicago. I mean, remember, Mr. Otis, as we've heard, invented the elevator. They didn't know what to do with it. And then Mrs. O'Brady's cow kicked over the lamp and burnt down the whole city. And then they knew what to do with it. And they suddenly realized that it was a way of getting over their inferiority complex. Chicago had, had this inferior, inferiority complex to New York. New York was the premier city of the US. Chicago was sitting there by the side of a very large lake and an even larger prairie, and nobody quite knew where they were. Just like somebody drowning, they thought they'd better start waving. And in addition to having, a, a, they also wanted to have the World's Fair around that time, and so they thought they'd better put on a bit of a show. They decided they'd build themselves a university, and they decided they'd go tall. And that was this, the birth of this idea that if you can build tall enough, if you can wave wildly enough, people will notice you and your economy will improve. And that's gone forward over the years. The Elephant and Castle has tried it. Frankfurt, before the 1990s, used to be a quiet market town. Now it's a quiet market town with skyscrapers. Because it's no fun. Nobody wants to go to Frankfurt. Would any of you think of going to Frankfurt for a dirty weekend? No, you wouldn't. So what's the point of building tall? They've got nothing to celebrate. Dubai has the world's tallest building. And it's just disappearing into the sand as the desert blows back to hide the excesses of man. Uh, there will be a time when people will visit it as they do the pyramids today and wonder what those wonderful shapes were for. But there's no need to build such a tall marker in such an unsustainable location. Pudong, well, luckily, Pudong is actually sinking under the weight of all those rejected schemes from the US and Europe, all those things that failed to get planning permission in the West that are now being built in Pudong. But it's just a wild excess of desperate waving for attention. It's obviously, you know, attention deficit syndrome writ large. There's another reason for building tall, and that's the reason that you've run out of space. Manhattan, surrounded by water. 
The reason New York went upwards because they didn't have enough land to build all that they needed to build. Hong Kong, very small territory, very difficult terrain. They built vertically to house the people that were there and to actually house the businesses as well. City of London, one square mile, we'd run out of space. Very popular with international financiers, as they used to be called. Uh, nowadays, we talk about ourselves as an insurance center, of course. Um, but nevertheless, there is demand for that space, and we're only one square mile as a business center. So the only way to provide the space that's required is to go vertically. Now, if you need to build tall, and as I say, I don't think you should build tall unless you have to, then I think you should do it well. It was a great pleasure to prove all the critics wrong. Remember those critics who said that the gherkin was sinking, when in fact all it was doing was settling on its foundations? Then all the windows were going to fall out. That didn't happen. And, and as a last resort, after they'd tried the fact that it wouldn't be able to be let because it was a circular building, it was a rude nickname. The Evening Standard called it the erotic gherkin. It was meant to be a curse. And the public said, what was that nickname? Gherkin. Yes, we like that. We think it's a wonderful building. Do you know you can see it from Epic Forest and you can see it from Kent? The public adopted it. They thought it was a wonderful shape. It became an inspirational icon for London, which even helped to get us the Olympic Games. And it changed people's perception of what tall buildings could be. It didn't have to, they didn't have to be boring as they'd been in the 60s and 70s. They could be imaginative. And to prove it, they decided they'd give them nicknames. The walkie-talkie, because it looked a bit like a, one of those 1950s Swedish telephones. The cheese grater, because it suddenly came to me that Ruth Rogers probably used one in River Cafe for the Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, Richard hates that nickname. He hates it even more than now, that, now that I've told Ruth and she likes the nickname. So that nicknaming process was part of the adoption of tall buildings. But tall buildings that were being well built in a cluster to minimize their environmental impact and built because they were needed for accommodation. <laughs> so I would say that it's important to decide why you're building tall, to build tall for the right reasons. And remember, it's not much fun having the world's second tallest building. So uh, Rowan admirably laid out the stall of this evening's conversation. Um, Peter has retorted with uh, a, a defense of the, uh, the city's position. And, um, and we're going to hear now from Julia, the architect. Thank you. I think I've got an image that needs to, to go up. Yes, thank you. Um, when we completed the London Eye, it was the fourth tallest structure in London, and now it's the, 30, the 21st, and tomorrow it'll probably be the 22nd or the 23rd. I merely mentioned this as an indicator of the speed of change. Growth of cities um, globally and the number of tall buildings is growing exponentially. I think Kevin's already given the, the figures that buildings over 200 metres have driven from uh, uh, 280 um, 10 years ago to 600 today, of which 57% are in Asia. And I'm not suggesting that London should or needs to compete in this race. As a mature, preeminent global city, we don't need to strut our stuff on the global stage in quite the same way that the young emerging cities do. However, I think we need to we ignore this uh, global context at our peril. In an increasingly fast-changing world, to stand still is to effectively move backwards. And I don't want London to become atrophied a heritage city um, like Paris or Kyoto, and equally I wouldn't want the kind of free-for-all in cities like Mexico City and Buenos Aires. I do think that tall buildings have a role to play in intensifying the city and making it more sustainable, and possibly even helping solve our housing crisis. Part of London's continuing success has always been its ability to embrace change, integrate new with old. But we need to manage and direct and control that change um, and not be at the mercy of global forces. And we do this, obviously, through the planning system. I agree that there have been some real clangers. I don't deny it. Um, in fact, I see one at the end of my street. I'm not going to mention them, but um, I live in Stockwell, not far from Vauxhall. Um, and uh, the Shard, on the other hand, I think is a welcome addition to the skyline. Its unique, elegant, articulated form that has echoes of London's church spires and the play of the light on the elevations angled towards the sky is beautiful. And it has helped to regenerate the London Bridge area and has transformed the scale of London. 
but mistakes have been made, so I think there is a case for a pause for thought about the effectiveness of the planning system. The planning system is the mechanism we have for creating a balance between social and market forces, between public benefit and private profit. And it's also the mechanism that makes judgments that balance the protection of the heritage of the past while at the same time, hopefully, allowing for the creation of the heritage for the future. We shouldn't forget that tall buildings are already part of our heritage and there are already 11 tall listed buildings in central London and I've put a number of them up on the right hand side. And um, they are recognized as successful examples of the integration of tall buildings. I think that it might be useful to take a thoughtful look at these buildings and learn some lessons. They're obviously all different and share a degree of, um, and, and are discrete, but I think they share um, a discrete dignity and a coolness and restrained structural logic, a forthright spare logical use of materials. And in the case of the Economist building in the New Zealand house, they get better the closer up you get to them. And they're, of high, they're built of high quality materials, Portland stone. Um, for a start. And London is a white city because of its prevalence um, use of Portland stone. So it's entirely logical that new buildings should make use of the same material. Centrepoint, the building we used to love to hate, works well not only because of the strengths of its form, but also because it's located at a major crossroads in the city. And the Millbank Tower, with its sophisticated plan shape that reflects the light um, and defies its mass, sits comfortably next to the space of the river and the adjacent and adjacent to Tate Britain. They show that tall buildings actually don't always have to be in clusters if they're good enough. And you'll notice also that none of them is a funny shape or inspired by Mr. Whippy. Because, and, but because they are so highly visible, there is a case, I think, that tall buildings need special attention in the planning system, just like bridges, to ensure that only the good ones get built. The point is that you can't light a skyline, I don't think, with a beautiful building. So we need to get a lot better at agreeing what makes good quality design, to set the bar a lot higher than it has been. And at the end of the day, it's quality that matters. Quality, not quantity, design quality, and the quality of life for all London citizens. Thank you, Julia. Uh, quality, context, and that word that we should start using a bit more, which is beauty. Um, our last contribution comes from Simon Jenkins. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm, I'm terribly aware that I've got an audience almost entirely composed of architects. Um, and, uh, well, I don't know. We could take another poll. Um, how, many here, how many architects <laughs> in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> Not, not a, surprisingly, not, no, not as many as I thought. How many, how many, how many good friends of architects? Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many partners dependent on that? I, I, a lifetime talking to architects. It's like, it's like talking to farmers about large fields. Um, nothing you say will persuade them. They're not a good idea. Um, and that also applies to tall buildings, in my experience. Um, however, um, uh, this is an interesting discussion. Um, in the first place, I don't think we're being extremist. Um, I think most people recognize there is a problem, a genuine problem in London. Uh, I've just finished a book on, called England's 100 Best Views. Um, and it's been a painful experience because almost all of them are painful now. Um, of them, six are in London, and of the five in inner London, every single one of them is a view of the Shard. Uh, and I've got very, very used to the Shard. Um, uh, I don't think it's regenerated Bermondsey. It's, it's like the Barbican. It's a, it's a fortified city within a city. Um, it's undeniably a beautiful building, and I don't think we need to argue about the beauty of some tall buildings. Um, I love the Towers of Dubai. Um, I find them extremely exciting. Um, I, I'm sorry if Peter wants his tall buildings always to be the biggest and not the second biggest. That's Peter's problem. Um, but uh, but um, there's no doubt at all that tall buildings can be lovely. Um, I think the question posed by the debate is, is, is essentially a planning one. It's the concept of the beauty of a skyline. Um, if nobody believes that a skyline can be beautiful or ugly, there's no discussion. I regard the London skyline as an almighty car crash. Uh, it is ridiculous to try and say now, oughtn't we to do something about the skyline of London as far as high buildings are concerned? It is too late. Uh, this is not about the economy. It's not about the need to build high. It's not about the need to show off to foreign countries like Ken Livingston kept on doing. I want a bigger building than anyone else. Um, it's actually about the design of our city. Uh, and it's about the design of a particular facet of the city, which is the horizon. Uh, um, I've watched the horizon of London change all my life. 
usually, I have to say, for the worst. Um, I'm sure someone will always say, oh, St. Paul's was a very big building, and why did you look at Canaletto and see all the spires and the dome? Um, I do regard that as a beautiful painting. Uh, I'm sure there are people who think that was a dull painting, whereas uh, this is better than Canaletto. Um, we have no conversation. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is not. Uh, and I think that there is a conversation about beauty in skylines. Um, and if there isn't, give up on conservation. But my sense, uh, 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 all of us on the panel, is think, think that there is such a conversation. There is such a thing as beauty. Um, and what I find heartbreaking about London is that in the last 20, 30 years, um, the past has been sold. In the 1960s and 70s, there were policies. There were policies about views of St. Paul's. There were policies about no towers in the West End. Um, the, uh, the policy began to crumble with the Euston Tower, Center Point, um, Stag Place. A uh, few towers went up, always uh, under the public sector. It was the public sector that said yes, usually in return for a ludicrous planning gain to do with a, a roundabout. Uh, the buildings were hardly ever let. The government always, always had, almost always had to move into them. Um, they were a really bad idea, but they sold the pass. Uh, and the trouble then was, everybody said, well, we've got a bad building at Victoria, we may as well have a bad building at Vauxhall. Um, the concept of planning the environment effectively came to an end in the 1970s. Uh, Peter, to his credit, tried to cluster in the East City, uh, and, um, and the only sad thing about that was, I have to say, is that he didn't succeed. Uh, the Barbican got away, Tower 42 got away, um, uh, he showed me around recently with some pride at the things that have, been, have, have gone up on the uh, east side of Grace Church Street, Bishopsgate Street. Um, what on earth is a walkie-talkie doing there? It's right out of place. Look at it. I mean, you can see it on that screen. Um, nobody um, has been in a position to dictate what the skyline of London should be. Um, and the result is genuinely sad. Uh, I mean, I think the city wasn't happy about the shard. Uh, it detracts from the city. Um, the conversation you have has no meaning if you can't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, all I'm trying to say is that there is such a thing as a beautiful skyline. Uh, the general policy in London was to cluster, but it failed. The policy now is to have no policy. Uh, the line of the Thames is going to be a line of tall buildings, more or less along its entire length. London is going to look extraordinary. Moscow will look beautiful by comparison with it. Uh, from Vauxhall to back to Bermondsey, there's going to be a row of towers and slabs. No one has designed them. There's no plan for them. No one says it's going to be beautiful that way. They've just done it because a developer came along and offered a Section 106 bribe to the state. Uh, that is not the way to plan a city. It's been a disaster. Thank you very much.